got a good shot of, uh, of, of Pike putting on his hat. Look at that. Pike's ready to go with the old school hat. We're ready to go with a Friday night edition of uh, Flames Nation Live. Happy Halloween, friends, and welcome to Flames Nation Live with lots to talk about today. It's Steinberg and Pike with you on a spooky edition of the program. It's probably not going to be that spooky, but uh, we've got lots to talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about whether or not the Flames should make a change at, uh, at center ice and, and should they be moving a certain player to center ice. We'll touch on that. Uh, what about the concept of breaking up Johnny Gaudreau and Sean Monaghan? And are they really still in the market for a defenseman? It was Scott who was first in. We've got Scott on the board. We've got Ryan on the board. We've got uh, Jordan with us on a Friday night. Uh, get your comments in, questions in on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Pat Steinberg from our Sportsnet 960 studio. There's the microphone to prove it and ryan pike is uh in his satellite studio or wherever uh, pike happens to be hi pike hi pat how are you doing buddy i'm good i'm good and uh it's good to be uh it's good to be with you on a friday night let's let's jump right in because this is maybe my favorite topic of of all time it's been my favorite topic for like the better part of two years so Yesterday on Sportsnet 960, the fan on comes that man right there, general manager, Brad True Living. And I ask him the question. I ask him, hey, actually, it was Peter Klein who asked him the question on Sportsnet 960. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving the correct credit. And, and he asks, hey, what about Elias Lindholm? Do you see him as a center iceman or do you see him as a winger next year? Listen to what Brad Tree Living had to say because I thought it was very interesting and somewhat telling. Here was Brad Tree Living on with us on the big show on Thursday. Guys, you wanted to, to, to accomplish. If we were to go into camp tomorrow, I wanted to give the coaches the ability, the flexibility, I guess is a better way to put it, of using Elias in a couple different roles. And with the addition of, with the addition of Josh, with the addition of Dominic, who, you know, one's a left and one's a right shot, but Dominic's played a lot on the right side. It allows you, if you want to go that route, to put Elias in the middle and you're not putting somebody, not putting a square peg in a round hole when you start looking at trying to re reconfigure your right side. So I think what, what the additions of these people do is it allows some flexibility. We all know we got a lot of left shots. we got some guys, and there are some guys that are more comfortable on their offside and so on and so forth. But we wanted to have some flexibility here that in the event you put Elias in the middle, not that you want to be bouncing them back every other day, but it, you know, this gives you flexibility with your roster. Um, it gives you a bunch of different looks. It makes your team more difficult to match up against. You can expose maybe some matchups on the other side. Um, and so we wanted to at least have that opportunity to look at it. Okay, so that is Brad Treliving from yesterday when he joined us on the big show. And, and essentially what the GM said was, hey, we went into our off season with the idea of wanting to give the coaching staff more flexibility and wanting to give the coaching staff the ability to move Lindholm to center if they wanted to. I love this idea, Pike. You know I have been hard on this idea for quite some time. Jordan says, I'd 100% move Lindholm to center. He's got more number one center traits than Monaghan. And, and that's, where, that's where I really fall in. Like, I feel, I think Sean Monaghan is a great player and somebody who can score 25, 30 goals in his sleep every season. There is huge value in that, no questions asked. However, I believe Elias Lindholm has the ability to take on those tough head-to-head -head minutes, can play it in the two-way game better, and can still give you 25, 30 goals and bring it offensively in that number one center role. I don't think you have to worry about the matchups or anything like that if Lindholm is your number one center. I believe if the Flames are not going to make any big changes to their forward group, that moving Lindholm to 
to the middle and making him your de facto number one center makes this team harder to match up against than they were last season. And hearing what we just heard from the GM, I it kind of feels like that might be the way that they're trending as well. Well, let, let's be honest here. I'm, I've, I've been on board with, with uh, this for a while. My other, my other observation is, much like during the Jerome McGinley years, the top line is whatever line Matthew Kachuk is on as the team's best player and best overall forward and the highest paid player. So your number one center is, by default, the guy who's playing with the best player. So the way I see it, uh, you know, right now it's sort of by default Backlund because that's sort of been their go-to. But I think Lindholm, like... I love Michael Backlund. You love Michael Backlund. And as you know, I believe it was uh, Will Nault on, on the big show after, uh, after the, the, the segment with, with Brad gave you the gears a bit about cheating on Backlund be- with your Lindholm love. And the thing is, I, I like though. the Swede. I okay? get the Lindholm love because Lindholm is like, if, like, if you compare Lindholm to where Backlund was at most of Backlund's ages and Backlund might even say this, Lindholm is arguably a better, more complete player already. You know, Backlund didn't become Backlund until he was in his mid to late 20s. Lindholm is already a 30, 30 goal scorer, you know, a high, high end player. And I think if you throw him to center, all of a sudden, like you, I think the, the big problem for the Flames right now, um, I think they had a few problems last year that came, that came to four in the playoffs, but you know, uh, how many good centers do they have? How many guys do they have who could take faceoffs from either side? And one of the things that made Derek Ryan so valuable for the Flames is he's pretty much, you know, he was the only full-time right shot center they had. And I think if your best slash only right shot faceoff option is a guy in his mid thirties, regardless of how good he is, that's kind of worrisome. So Lynn, just in terms of sheer succession, like if you're planning for at some point, Derek Ryan's going to go either retire, go play in Seattle, you know, go home and, you know, uh, run a hockey school in Spokane or something. At some point, they're not going to have Derek Ryan anymore. So if you're planning just for sheer logistics, you want to get a, a right shot center and they have a pretty good one in Lindholm. Like, you know, he was in there for like 20 some games this year and he looked real good. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Kleiner suggested returning at some point to the Mangiapane, Lindholm and Kachuk line as an option. That's the one that's the one that I have been hammering so is get those those guys were together for 26 games last year from early December to early February Majapani Kachuk Lindholm was a line during that time uh, Lindholm had 20 points during that time, Lindholm was the top even strength scorer on the team, and their underlying numbers were really, really strong. Uh, that line, I am. That's the line that I am. Yeah, is in love with a little strong. Yeah, maybe it's a you little strong. You have a crush on that line. I, I am. Yeah, how- how about enamored? I'm 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 enamored by by the combination of Manjapani, Kachuk, and Lindholm. The, the thing I'm excited about, and I, I know Brad brought it up when he was talking with you guys yesterday, just the idea of okay, like they they have Josh Levo, and Josh Levo is he a bona fide twenty goal scorer, high end player? Well, no, but part of that is he has he's had bad injury luck and he hasn't really had the opportunity to do it because he's been in areas like you know if you're Toronto. All due respect to Josh Levo, if you have the type of young stud players that the Toronto Maple Leafs had access to, are you really going to have the ability to give Josh Levo a fair shake in your top six or even your your middle six? And the answer for in Toronto has been a definitive no. But here, I mean, I imagine some of the sales pitch here. If you're if you're the Flames trying to convince Josh Levo to come here, I mean, you close your eyes and think about, oh my, imagine like Josh Levo is kind of a pain in the ass to play against. Imagine him and, and Sam Bennett on the same line. Imagine like mm-hmm. one of the big problems the Flames have is, you know, Kachuk is pretty much the only guy who can consistently pull his teammates into the muck. May, maybe Dubé at times too, but Kachuk's much more consistent at it. So if you add, add a Levo to that, all of a sudden you have some of that uh, some of that jam in two or three of your lines rather than having to really lean on your Bennett's and your Kachuk. So it spreads that out a bit. But also, like, he can play all over the place. And same with Dominic Simone. Like, Dominic Simone, he was in Pittsburgh, played in their top six at times and played pretty well. The, played with Crosby for the, a good the chunk of time. The big knock I've read on Simone and Levo is – they just have terrible puck luck. They can't bury their chances. If you put them with guys that can bury their chances, though, 
then you might be in good shape. So like, you know, just if, if we're, if we're going the, well, if you, if you move, move Monahan off the top line, where does he go option? There are some interesting players that the Flames haven't had before that could find a way to get the biscuit to Sean Monahan, where Sean Monahan mm-hmm. tends to do well, which is the area right on the net. So I think I did the, did the Flames go out and, you know, pick up somebody who's a bona fide, you know, top six player and completely reshape their four group? Well, no. But I think that the tinkering that they did has given them the ability to mix and match and, you know, muck things around. I mean, depending on what they do with lines, like, we're going to have a comp- – whatever schedule we get, it's going to be a compressed schedule. And they're going to be playing on back-to-backs and stuff. So it's going to be – like, I think the teams that can run their lines and run their benches and keep their guys fresh, like, you know, I think – if if you're not if you don't want to kill poor Johnny Gaudreau with like 20 minutes a night for two or three nights in a row, you're gonna need to find ways to lighten the load and give him you know some different options. And I think that what they've done is made the team you know is line one any better than it was three weeks ago? I don't think so. But are lines two to four a little bit more versatile and a little bit easier to throw out uh, at any given time? I mean. I, I think they've made some good changes there. So, you know, and I think, like you said, if you put Lindholm at center, all of a sudden your questions of, oh, like do, Sam Bennett hasn't played a lot of center. Do you want to use Sam Bennett at center? Well, now you don't really have to because if, you're, if your top four centers are hypothetically Lindholm, Monaghan, Backlund, and some combination of Bennett and Derek Ryan, that's pretty good. And I think yep. that might be what they're looking at. Yep. Here are uh, here are a few comments on this uh, on this particular topic. As um, Jordan says, Lindholm shown a mean streak as well. He's a troll, and that would make him good at center. He has uh, who was it? The Red Wings player. It was uh, Darren Helm who he had that uh, little battle with at the Saddle Dome last season. Uh, Josh writes, I don't mind Lindholm at sea, but please, for the love of God, stick to it. I hate when they flip-flop a guy from center to wing throughout the season. Nobody wins that way. We saw that early on with Bennett. I am in a complete agreement with Josh on that. If you're going to move Bennett to the middle, uh, sorry, Lindholm to the middle, do it long term. Do it for the the entire season or like give it a 40 game run at the very least. And and if you don't like it after 40 games, OK, then maybe make a change. But give it a nice run. Mike says trees hinting Monty's going bye bye in a possible trade or is he wanting Levo to slide up to the top six? I don't think Brad Tree Living's tipping his hand to a Sean Monahan trade. I don't think Brad Tree Living ever tips his hand. He'd be a very good poker player. Um I, I I am going about this conversation, Pike, of moving Lindholm to the middle under the impression that the forward group does not have a massive change coming to it, under the impression that Monaghan, Gaudreau, et al. will all be back here next season. That's the impression I'm working under when having this chat about Lindholm. Yeah, and, you know, until like the cap is what it is, and, you know, I don't – I think we're probably going to see – basically this group when whenever camp opens in january december december it's gonna open in december let's be optimistic sure sure pat sure uh but yeah like you know with with the nba starting in december they got a better tv deal I think January 15. That's a nice. That's a nice middle ground for when Fingers the season crossed. starts. But yeah, I, I think let's let's be completely honest. In all due respect to Zach Ronaldo, Zach Ronaldo was a great 13th, 14th forward. But if you need to roll out Zach Ronaldo and Buddy Robinson on a regular basis, or roll the dice on Glenn Godden or Matthew Phillips being ready for everyday action, like that's not that's just not fair to those players. And I think, you know, if this is, we've discussed this in the past, this is a hockey club that thinks they can do some damage in the playoffs. I know people are probably rolling their eyes at this, but they, like, this isn't a team that's too far removed from a monster team of two years ago. They just, they th- I think that they think they just need to get the right chemistry and get the, get everything rolling. So, you know, they, I don't think we can argue that their goaltending isn't better than it was a month ago. Uh, their defensive group, uh, I like 
I like parts of it and some of it make me nervous, but I think they have, it's, not it's definitely deep, not as deep that's for sure. At least at the high level, but you know, uh, right. Like today, you saw Valabaki, uh, Yoki, uh, Nervine and, uh, a, a colleague of mine from Dauber prospects who follows, uh, Finland a lot. Uh, he did a, an update on Dauber prospects. Uh, I, I retweeted it today. So if you're on my Facebook or on my Twitter, rather check it out. Cause the whole breakdown is really cool. He called Yusuf Alamaki, the best player in SM Liga and SM Liga, the, the highest league in Finland is a good league. And there's. It's probably the fifth best league it's, in the world. That's why I, I have it behind AHL, NHL, KHL, and SHL. I think it's yeah. probably number so five he's, in the world. He's the best player on a, on a good team, a point-per-game player from the blue line when he hasn't played meaningful hockey in over a year and a half. So uh, the Flames probably don't want to force him to be a top-four player right away, but he seems like the type of kid, if you talk to him for 30 seconds, you get the impression from talking to him that he wants to kick the door down and steal somebody's gig. And that's the type of player you want in your team. So they, I think if, if he breaks well, if Anderson can continue taking steps, like there's a lot of things that need to go well for the team to be better on the defensive end. But up front, like they just they, realistically, they can they just need to avoid some significant injuries. And so knock on wood, they stay healthy. I think the group they have. Is pretty well, I do think like I, I do think it's important in that. So this uh, this comes in from Mike says, I think they need to separate Johnny and Monty uh, and and come up with something different. And this is the most interesting. And this is what I believe is the most important concept to, to delve into when it comes to the flames next year. Cause I'm with you. Goaltending's better. I still him. The D is fine, but I am not comfortable in the flames going deep. If they're just going to do what they did last year. And that is have a line of Monaghan, Gaudreau and Lindholm and go with the backland line. I think they need to start coming up with different ways of structuring their forwards. So on the screen right now, it says, uh, this is an article I wrote earlier this week at Flames Nation. Flames should make a big change at forward, but it night, might not be in the cards. And and I think that it's probably fair to say, because uh, I see that you know Zach on the comments has been talking about they need to make a big change. And I think if there is a big change available, they should make it. But I just don't know in this economic climate if it's available to them. So in saying that, I think if they're going to come back with the same core forward group, they have to come back with different looks. And one of those different looks is moving Lindholm to the middle. And I am very steadfast that they should move Lindholm to the middle. I don't know if you heard that or not. But another another thing that they could do is break up Sean Monaghan and Johnny Gaudreau and distribute that a little bit differently. But I am against that. I'm curious as to where you are. I don't like the idea of Monaghan and Gaudreau being split up if they're on the same team because the splits, when they're not together, are not very good, specifically for Monaghan. They are ugly when he's not. Over the last five years, they're a pretty decent duo when playing together at five on five. When Monaghan is away from Gaudreau, like he the, the on-ice totals have him bleeding high-danger scoring chances and bleeding shot attempts. Like, his possession rate at 5-on-5 five five drops about 10% away from Gaudreau, and the high-danger scoring chance rate drops by, like, 20% at natural stat trick. Like it's scary with Monaghan away from Gaudreau, and Gaudreau is not as effective away from Monaghan. I say keep them together. But I also think you need to deploy them a little bit differently, start deploying them in more favorable positions where they can get better opposition, or, or I guess in this case, not as good opposition, and you can put them in more offensive spots to succeed. So some people think you should split them up. I don't think you should. Where are you on that? I go both ways. I mean, like we, we saw them during that stretch last season where, where Jeff Ward sort of mucked around with the lines and... You know, poor Michael Backlund was playing on the left side and just looked completely lost at times. I forget who okay, who was on the right side. This is bothering me. It was Backlund, Monahan, and a third player whose name I forget. What like when they switched yeah, things who was on around? the right side? It was with Gaudreau because Monahan and Gaudreau stayed together with Backlund on the oh, right. Oh yeah, yeah, that was it. Was weird, man. It was, but but again, at least because they they had they had Lindholm between Manjapani and Kachuk, yeah. and then they Dude. had. Monahan between Gaudreau on the left and then this bizarre experiment with back. But on the they right. all, I think one of the things that allowed them to do that is 
they had that Dubé, Lucic, Ryan line that was just cooking from basically as soon as they got yes. put together. So I think that allowed them to sort of muck around with the other lines because they had one line that was doing so well. Uh, that said, I be, like, here's here's my thought: if you keep Backland and, or if you keep uh, Monahan and Gaudreau together and it doesn't work, you have one line that's sort of wonky. If you put them apart and it don't work, you got two lines that are wonky. And especially like I, I'm going to harp on this until you know we get to the season. It's going to be a compressed schedule. It's going to be a lot of back to backs. You're going to have to line ma- your line matching will probably be out the window. It'll be a lot of rolling four lines. So I think we're going to see a lot of teams, the Flames included, trying to have four good lines instead of at times the Flames had one good line and a bunch of guys. Thankfully, not the last few years, but you know that's been the, that's been the case. So I think for the for what they need to do is yeah, try go with the four best lines you can put together. If Gaudreau and Monahan don't work, change how you use them because I think until until uh, they have a chance to do anything with the roster, I think this is the group they have to go to war with, and I think they have to figure out ways to do it. Um, I, I I know in your piece you sort of uh, touched on some possibilities for a winger to go with them who could do some damage. Uh, I like Levo. I, I'm a big fan of Dylan Dubé. I think Dubé is an extremely versatile player, and I think that could be an interesting fit. We've seen Sam Bennett in that in that scenario, mm-hmm. and I think you know one of the one of the reasons why Lindholm, when that line works, does so well is because Lindholm is an extremely smart player. He can skate. He doesn't mind getting in the corners. And so, if you're looking for a guy, and he's got a good shot, yeah. and that's all. That's all Levo. I, I'm I'm interested in Levo yeah. too. But, but, but He's like a Lindholm. My light. dark horse is Dubé, though. My dark horse is Dubé, because think of how, just think of how much Dubé improved from from like January until the playoffs. Like he did not play in t- from between March and August, but he looked like he had played like five years in the NHL, and it, you know he looked thicker, he looked faster, he looked like he was gonna punch out somebody every thirty seconds, like. And again, anyone who wants to just absolutely salivate at possibilities, uh, Dylan Dubé is one of three Flames players on the roster who has a, a World Junior Gold Medal. He got it as a captain of Team Canada, and he and I think we saw some of that, some of those traits in the playoffs because that goal he scored in, against Dallas, where he just absolutely turnstiled on Shakara, was just. Absolutely, like, you shouldn't be able to do that to a grown man who's played the NHL for the better part of a decade. I mean, in fairness, it was Sekra. I'm not taking anything away from the Dubé goal. Yeah, but it was yeah, he, uh, he turned him inside. And I believe out. Uh, 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 a nice thanks to Thomas Drance of the Athletic, who was at all the uh, the Western Bubble games and uh, did this beautiful feature about chirps that players were giving to each other. Uh, the shift before that goal. Uh, Dubé got got dropped by one of the Dallas players and got chirped that does he think he's a rock star or something? And then the very next shift, he just absolutely just slices and dices the Dallas Stars. So maybe he does think he's a rock star, but I think like he's going to be a guy that you know long term. That 2016 draft, they produced a Kachuk, which is a home run, but Dubé is turning into a pretty effective player. His contract. He's a bona fide NHLer. Like, there's no. He's doubt gonna about get uh, the, the D- Dave Cowan, uh, the agent, represents Dubé. He represents Mont- uh, was it Dubé, uh, Valamaki, and uh, Glenn Godden. Uh, that's he. He he's gonna have a good summer next year because Dubé and Valamaki are up for new deals, and it's sounding like both of them are well positioned for good seasons. But yeah, me me the. I I'm a big dub guy. I, I kind of like Labardius like that. Uh, I'd love to see Dubé get a shot in the top six, but I'll have it depends on what they do. But I think, you know, he's proven he can help drive play at this level. So, you know, I, I, outs- I think in an ideal world, in an ideal world, Jeff Ward could just put numbers into a hat and pick out three guys and he'd find a good combination of three guys. And it, it may, you know, I don't think we're going to get a traditional preseason this year because otherwise I'd say, screw it. It's your first preseason as, as an NHL head coach. Just get your NHL group together and then just pick names out of a hat and make, you know, make a big make a big show of it. It'll be fun for the fans. It'll be fun for us as analysts. I don't think that's a possibility this year. And I also don't think they have, you know, I, I think the personnel they have back, you know, the, the Gaudreau and Monaghan are just 
right now best suited to play with each other because I don't think they really have the runway right now to really experiment this year. But hypothetically, if they're both here after the Seattle Kraken enter the league and the season is back to normal in 21-22, by all, at that point, by all means, you know, go go nuts because I think that'll be the time to really get funky and experiment with... with that'll be that'll be the last year of Gaudreau's contract. That's... Yeah. Uh, that's a new conversation that we could have another time on Flames Nation Live. I want to read a couple of the comments here uh, about some of what we've been talking about before we move on to our final topic, and that's about the blue line. Uh, but Zach says, would you rather have a massive change and improve the top six or move Lindholm to center in hopes that you'll shake things up? I know you said, Pat, that it's a hill you'll die on, but if it's me right now, I'm not looking at this top six and saying, wow, they're scary because we knew they needed changes, but nothing has happened yet. I'm not saying, Zach, that they... My number one is making a change. In fact, I my number one is move Lindholm to center and make a change. That's my number one. But I'm saying I'm just not confident that that change is out there. So with that change not happening and with it potentially not being in the cards, I still think you have to do something different with how you deploy your forwards. Uh, Jordan's not sure he would like Johnny Monahan and Dubé. I don't mind that. I, I don't mind any one of Dubé, Levo, or uh, Bennett as potential wingers for those guys if it's not Lindholm. Uh, Kyle likes uh, Chuck uh, Kachuk, Lindholm, and Manjapani as a line. I like that as well. Um, so there's uh, there are definitely going to be some interesting line combinations for the Calgary Flames next season. It's Steinberg and Pike on Flames Nation Live. Here's a tweet from Noah that... Uh, Brings us into our final topic. Uh, it says, with the rumor being that the team's in search of another right shot D, wonder if it's possible a bigger deal for that option could be coming. If it was me, I'd try and make a package deal with Columbus involving Monaghan and Shillington for Savard and Bjorkstrand. Your thoughts? Now, I, I, I don't know about that deal in and of itself, Noah, but I do wonder a little bit about what Darren Drager reported yesterday in a veteran right shot defenseman and they're likely going to explore the trade route for that I don't know who that player would be because yeah you could go look at any team in the league and say oh they need a right shot defenseman but what's more interesting to me is if if the flame or they have a right shot defenseman rather what's more interesting to me is how the flames would go and get that right shot guy so let's say that we're not talking about an nhl minimum reclamation project let's say that we're talking about an established right shot defenseman that you'd be comfortable with moving into your second pair if Chris Tanev gets injured, like that's the type of player. So let's say we're talking in and around two to $3 million as his AAV. If that's the case, you're probably talking about a Derek Ryan. You're probably talking about a Sam Bennett. You're probably talking about a David Riddick as potential trade chips that could get that guy. I don't like, I don't like the I the idea of some of those trade chips, but if they're looking for an established veteran right shot defenseman in a trade, that's their cap situation suggests that's probably the way they'd have to go do it, right? Yeah, it's it's gonna have to be a money in, money out thing. And I think, you know, I I, I kinda get the the mindset of it, but you know, like in, until you know that that Lindholm can, you know, be your right shot your right shot center savant good young forward 2013 to 20 period was they had agent there who could just you know he could take the the terrible deployments and just teach guys and Derek Ryan can take the terrible deployments and teach guys and so I think I wouldn't want to throw him to the wolves right you know you know just throw him overboard right away because he's so good he's been such a good soldier and he's so versatile for them he can play anywhere uh I'd be ter I wouldn't want to move Riddick right now because 
you know, I'm with you on that one. Ming. I don't like the Luka idea Ming of is coming Ming. off a not great season. Like he was sort of all over the place. And then until you really know, until you have some stability for Deming and know that he can be, you know, a guy you can rely on. Like I all due respect to Louis Deming. He seems like a good person and a pretty decent NHL goalie, but he's bounced around a ton of the last three or four seasons. And part of me, part of me makes me go, well, what is it about this guy's game? that you just can't latch on somewhere. And, you know, it has been, you know, he's been the worst. The worst thing you can say about him is his second halves kind of suck. But you know, if if he's used more like a backup, like remember when he took over for uh, for for Eddie Lack uh, three seasons ago when they you know they they traded assets to bring in Eddie Lack, a veteran backup goalie, and he absolutely was not very good. And after four starts, they said we need a goaltender who can actually do things. Let's bring in the kid. So. That kind of thing tends to work, but yeah, I'd be, I would love it if they had the cap space to make the deal. And if they say weren't spending $2.7 million on buyouts this year, but that's the world they're living in. So they're going to have to probably live with probably the roster they have, unless they want to cannibalize another part of it. It's, um, I like, for instance, I like this one from Justin on, on our uh, Facebook live, um, sidebar. Buffalo seems like an interesting trade partner. What about Brandon Montour for Sam Bennett or something like that, or a package like that? I love the idea of Brandon Montour. That one is, I, I like, I think Will threw it out on the big show a few weeks ago, and I was like, yes, but prior to free agent, I'm like, yeah, Brandon Montour, absolutely. 26, right shot D. Uh, they just signed him to a one-year extension. He's at 3.85, and he's a pending UFA. Like, am I huge on the idea of trading Bennett? No, I'm not trying to trade Sam Bennett for the sake of it, but Bennett for Montour, yeah, I'd be interested in a trade like that because I think it could help you. You're dealing from a position of strength up front and helping an area that you might need a little bit more. They still don't have a natural right shot third pairing defenseman. Nesterov shoots left, and that's who we have penned in right now. And then Dallas says sign Vatanen and then trade Ryan. I like the Montour trade a whole lot more. I don't know if that's in the cards. Um Vatnin scares me as a right shot defenseman, Pike, only because of the injury history. He's been really injury prone lately. That worries me a little bit because we're already talking about Tanev, who has never been able to play a full NHL season. So Vatnin scares me a little bit. Yeah. And I don't know if like if you're rolling out a, you know, seven man group, eight man group that has three guys in Vatnin, Tanev and Valimaki with very significant recent injury histories like that that makes me nervous i mean it could work but you would need to basically white knuckle it to the season and let, let's be honest like the flames don't have a lot of cap space to deal with injuries right now i mean uh assuming i think uh on puckpedia uh, there's 1.01 million dollars in cap space and that include that means they have to sign uh shillington or whoever's the thir- the seventh defenseman and then they have like Assuming a a league men deal for for Shillington or his replacement, that's $300,000 or $310,000 to deal with injuries, trades, hangnails, guys getting the flu, etc. Oh, and uh, you know how we were talking about how great use of Alamaki has been this year in in Sweden or Finland, rather? Uh, He has $425,000 of uh, potential performance bonuses in his deal. So if he's... If he plays top four minutes, uh, if he has a good plus minus, is he sc- if he scores 40 points or a prorated amount, whatever, all of a sudden that $310,000 is down to a lot less. So I, they, whatever they do, they, they're going to have to have flexibility in mind because, you know, I, there a lot of their hopes and dreams, folks. Uh, if the Flames are going to be a team that contends for championships or, or opens a lot of eyes this year, it's going to be because some of these moves, Levo, uh, you know, uh, Dominic Simone, uh, Nesterov, Valimaki, Dubé, you know, all these young guys, these, these fringe pieces and young guys taking a step. The problem is if the young guys take a step, a couple of them have bonuses involved, and all of a sudden – they have no cast base this year. They don't have a less. ton of flexibility right now. 
Yeah, and for for the folks that are curious, you're allowed to go over the salary cap by performance bonuses, but whatever you whatever you're over this year, you lose from next year. It's another flat cap next year. Uh, granted, pretty much everybody who's important is re, is signed for next year. They have a couple decisions to make. They're gonna have to re-sign Bennett or trade him for Magic Beans. They're gonna have to re-sign uh, Riddick or trade him for Magic Beans. Uh, they have a few guys like that, and. Let's let's just be completely honest. You're probably not going to replace uh, Riddick or Bennett with somebody who's cheaper. Uh, so, in, well, granted, unless you have somebody coming up to the farm system like I don't know Pelche. If Pelche kicks the door down, okay, that's a cheaper option on your third line. But there's there's no goalie in the system right now who's a year away from becoming an NHL backup goalie and playing 25 to 35 games. It's just it's not in the cards. So you're going to be spending money on that and. They they can't they can't afford to go over the cap this year because they can't afford to lose space next year. So yeah. that's the Flames capologists amongst the capologists from what twenty six of thirty one teams this year are gonna have their hands full all season. A uh, couple of things, uh, just a couple of Flames notes to tag at the end. Connor Zeri and Jacob Pelche are going to Team Canada's World Junior Selection Camp next month in Red Deer. Uh, the 2020 and 2019 first round picks, respectively. Today they loaned Glenn Godden to Switzerland. Not the top league, but the second league in Switzerland. They've loaned Godden over there. So those are a couple of uh, additional Calgary Flames notes. Just quickly, what's uh, what's happening in the next little bit over at FlamesNation.ca? Well, you just mentioned it, Pat. We're going to get into a bit of World Junior stuff. Uh, we're looking at uh, over the weekend uh, what flames have a chance of going, uh, and what flame, and also what flames have gone. Because you know, I mentioned uh, Dylan Dubé is one of three uh, World Junior gold medalists on the Flames roster. So we'll we'll take a look at the the medal history and participation history of the various Flames. Uh, I, I'll just throw this out there, Patty. Uh, Ryan Francis has two goals tonight. Cape Breton beat the St. John Sea Dogs and Jeremy Poirier five four in overtime. Uh, so some prospect action in the queue. Uh, Yusuf Alamaki had an assist in a uh, 6-1 route this afternoon. And uh, Ichu Tolola had a goal in Vastrovic's win uh, over Moto this afternoon. So there's lots of prospect stuff going on. Um, I'll just throw this out there, folks. Uh, we, you, know, you will hear Pat and I at various points uh, uh, wax poetic o- over uh, uh, goaltending prospect uh, Daniil Chechilev. Uh, if you go to Google and just Google VHL, uh, the, the the minor hockey league in Russia streams all their games live uh, on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, uh, they they'll, they have uh, things you can set up subscriptions to. It'll ding your phone every time Chechilev's playing. It's a nice way to to kill an hour in the afternoon at work, allegedly. Unless you're hosting a radio show, and then I guess you can't do that. Yeah, it's it's harder for me in the afternoon to to catch a catch a Chechilev game in the in the VHL, but not not completely impossible. Uh, have a good weekend, Pike. Be safe on Halloween, or else. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a spooky Halloween. By spooky, I mean I'm hiding indoors. I I haven't dressed up on Halloween for about 15 years. Follow us on socials, uh, Pike on Insta and Twitter, myself on Insta and Twitter, and of course, uh, Flames Nation, Insta, Facebook, and Twitter. You've been watching on Facebook Live. The big show goes every uh, weekday, 1 till 6 p.m. on Sportsnet 960, The Fan. For Pike, I'm Steinberg. We'll talk to you again soon on Flames Nation Live. Have a great weekend. Don't forget, set your clocks back on Saturday. It's fall back, and be safe. Be very, very safe this Halloween. We'll talk to you soon. It's been another edition of Flames Nation Live. Goodbye, everybody. We'll miss you.